Paper Project Online for about 15 years now, maybe a little bit more than 15 years. And I still use it on a day-to-day -day basis to create and track projects. Um, we use Project Server heavily as well. Uh, so I have run into probably some of the ha same headaches that you have run into or maybe I should say challenges, and hopefully have some workarounds that will be helpful for you um, as you continue to work with Microsoft Project as well. So here's what I'd like to do today. We're going to take just a couple of minutes, and I promise it'll be quick. I want to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Then we're going to look at defining your project and entering tasks, entering estimates, dependencies, and constraints, defining and assigning resources, and then identifying the critical path and tracking your progress. And of course, that's time permitting. Sometimes we run out of time before we get there. And then we'll wrap everything up at the end. So who is Microsoft Project now? What do we do? We are a consulting firm that focuses solely on Microsoft Project, Project Server, and Project Online. We help organizations implement it. We train people on using Microsoft Project. We help people develop PMOs. Um, you name it. Anything that has anything to do with project management for the most part, uh, we can go in and, and help an organization either create their processes or improve their processes or map their processes to project or project server. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are also a gold certified partner in PPM with Microsoft um, and have several people on staff who had to get certifications and all that good stuff in order to achieve that status. All of our consultants do have uh, at least 10 years of experience with Microsoft Project. Uh, so we have a lot of experience. If you guys run into any problems or you need some help with anything, feel free to reach out to us and we would be happy to help point you in the right direction. So here's what we are going to do today. We're going to focus on eight steps to help you be more successful with your schedules in Microsoft Project. Now, these come from best practices. They're not just things that I made up. Uh, this a combination of experiences that I've had with Microsoft Project, as well as well-documented um, courseware from multiple other experts in the industry as well. There are eight steps that will help you not only build a good schedule, but make it easier for you to manage and track that schedule later on down the road. I always tell people, you know, pe people want the quick and easy way to create their schedule in Microsoft Project, and that's just not going to cut it. If you want to be able to easily manage your schedule down the road and you want it to give you realistic information, you've got to invest some time up front building it, getting it set up correctly so that you have a foundation to work with as you begin to see changes in your project and want to reflect reflect those changes in your schedule. So step one, you're going to define the project. That's where you're setting options. You're going to do this before you ever enter any tasks into the schedule. Step two, you're going to enter those tasks. Step three, you're going to enter estimates and then dependencies. And then constraints, if you have any, though we want to you know, minimize those as much as possible. <laughs> In step six, you will define and assign your resources. And then step seven, you are looking at your critical path. And one of the things that you're going to be able to tell from your critical path is whether or not you have all of those dependencies in place that you were supposed to set up in step four. And then finally, the last step is entering your progress information. How do you track what's really happening? Because we all know the only constant in any project is change. And if we want to have a schedule that we can really work with, we have to, you know, it has to be a living, breathing schedule. So we have to constantly be revising it so that we have good forecast information um, and, and accurate tracking information as well. Let's talk a little bit about step one. In step one, when we define the project, you're going to want to set the project start date. I can't tell you how many times I have seen people create a milestone at the top line of their schedule, and they call that milestone start. And they set the date on that milestone, and then they link that to every task that can start at the beginning of the project. There's a much easier way to do it. So we're going to go into project information and set that start date. You can also set a different calendar there if you want a different calendar. And we're going to talk about task mode and task type. These are things that you want to set up, again, before you ever enter any tasks into the schedule. In particular with your calendar, if you are going to use anything other than a typical 
eight hours a day, five days a week calendar, the default standard calendar, you're going to use six hours a day instead. You've got to make some changes in your calendar options, not just applying the calendar to that project, but also changing the way project calculates one day. You need to tell it that one day is now the equivalent of six hours instead of eight hours. So let's go into Microsoft Project and let's take a look at exactly how you can do that. You'll give me just a second for project to load. All right, I'm going to give that another minute just to make sure everyone can see that. And I'll go ahead and open a blank schedule since I just told you the importance of doing these things before you enter any tasks into your schedule. All right, hopefully you all can see my screen now. What I'm going to do is go up to the file. Well, I tell you what, let's go to project ribbon first. In the project ribbon, you can see that I've got a box, an icon called project information. That's where you're going to go to set the project start date. Now you've got the option of scheduling from the project start date or the project finish date. Schedule it from the project start date. Don't do it from the project finish date. If you do it from the project finish date, every task is scheduled to start and finish at, as late as possible. You have no slack in your schedule. It's basically a procrastinator's dream come true, but you don't have any room for error in a schedule like that. There are some scheduling methodologies that would call for that, but for the most part, people are going to be using the start date uh, to schedule from. Disregard the information you see on the bottom half of this dialog box. This is here because I'm attached to Project Server. Um, you've got your current date, status date. Look at your calendar field. Now, I've got a couple of different calendars here that I could choose from. I'm going to leave the standard calendar as is. That's the calendar I'm going to use uh, for this particular project. However, if I were going to change that calendar, like let's use the example I said before, uh, to a six-hour day calendar, to account for the fact that my resources are never going to be available to work on projects eight hours a day. So what I'm going to do is go into File and then Options. And in the Options dialog box, that's really big. Let me make that a little bit smaller. In the Options dialog box, we want to go to the Advanced tab. And as you get to the Advanced tab, you'll see some options here um, on the Advanced tab, you know, Planning Wizard type stuff. Um, some of the things that you want to be aware of in the Advanced tab, if you're going to be linking projects, um, you know, to other projects, external dependencies and things like that, you've got some options there you want to be aware of. And then some calculation options for when you're updating progress. We're not going to go into those in any great detail. We're going to focus more on the schedule area. If you have a six-hour-a-day calendar, when you look at the options here, calendar options, hours per day by default is eight, hours per week by default is 40. You want to change that if your standard calendar reflects anything different. Because right now, Project thinks that one day duration is the equivalent of eight hours duration. If you have a project calendar that only has six working hours a day, you assign a resource to a task that takes one day. Project thinks it needs eight hours, so the duration that shows up in your schedule is going to be like one point, I don't know, 1.2 or whatever that would come out to be, 1.25 days or something like that. It's going to give you all these fractions, and they don't make a whole lot of sense. So the bottom line is if you use a different calendar, make sure you adjust your calendar options as well. Now as we scroll down, you see that there are some additional options. New tasks created, auto scheduled. This is not the default in Microsoft Project. Now if you're using a version prior to 2010, you won't have this option. By default, everything is set to be manually scheduled. You want to change that right away. In fact, when you change it, don't just change it for the project you're on. Change it for all new projects and make sure they're set to auto-scheduled. Now, it's grayed out here because of the way I have it configured in Project Server, but you would be able to change it if you're using only Microsoft Project Professional. The other option that you need to be aware of here is the default task type. By default, the default task type is fixed units. And I would suggest strongly 
that you almost never use the fixed units task type when you're setting up your schedule. It's either going to be fixed duration or fixed work. And we'll talk about how to choose which one of those you're going to use when we get to the section on estimating in just a few minutes. Let's come back to this business about auto-scheduled versus manually scheduled tasks. Now, in 2010, Microsoft added the manually scheduled task feature. And this was added primarily for people who had been used to scheduling in Excel. And when they start scheduling in project, they expect project to act a little bit more like Excel. Well, if you make a task manually scheduled, it does act a little bit more like Excel. So on the task ribbon, I'm just going to make this task manually scheduled. Now what happens here, the bar changes, so you know it's manually scheduled, and you've got the little icon in the task mode column as well. Instead of entering the duration one day, I could come in here and say about three days. And my start date, yeah, I'm not real sure of it, but I think it's going to be early August. So you can actually enter text into these fields that, are, uh, that you obviously could not do if it was an auto-scheduled task. I would say that if you're going to use them at all, the only time you want to use them is at the very beginning of the project when you have very little information. However, I'm also going to state that I never use them and I have not yet run into a situation that makes me believe it's ever a good idea to use them. Um, people argue with me about that all the time, beginning of the project. Hey, knock yourself out. I don't use them. I wouldn't use them. Um, you know, even if you turn it into an auto-scheduled task at some point, which you definitely would need to do, it captures information in the background, and I've just seen it cause more problems than it's worth, quite honestly. So I would suggest that you leave everything as auto-scheduled tasks. You can look down here in the bottom of your tray where it says new tasks auto-scheduled. You can change it right there as well. But I would change it in that options area so that it automatically applies to any new project that you're going to create. All right, let's jump back over into the... Uh, presentation. We're going to talk a little bit more about the next step. So give me a second to switch back over to that. And you should see that load here in just a second. All right, so we talked about the options. We talked about defining the project, your start date, the task mode and task type, as well as setting or applying a different calendar and how to adjust those settings if you are. Step two is entering your tasks. Now, if you've been using Microsoft Project at all, you know where to go to enter your tasks. You don't need a coaching session on type here, <laughs> enter text in this space, and so on and so forth. But there are some best practices that I'd like you to be aware of when it comes to entering tasks in Microsoft Project. First of all, you want to identify your deliverables. So hopefully before you ever touch Microsoft Project, you're building a work breakdown structure outside of Project. You're identifying what the major deliverables are in the project, what the sub-deliverables are in the project. And then you're going to build that work breakdown structure in Microsoft Project. But at that lowest level of your work breakdown structure, you're going to add those detailed tasks, the steps required to meet that deliverable. Your deliverables in Microsoft Project should always be represented with a summary task. So you're going to have the deliverable at the very top and then the tasks required to meet that deliverable below it. All of your detailed tasks, um, you know, like I said, are going to be listed below that milestone, uh, that milestone, below that uh, summary task, which is your deliverable, so that you can see exactly what needs to be done. And we're going to talk about the right level of detail in just a few minutes. And then at the end of each deliverable, so at the bottom of each group of subtasks, you want to have a milestone. And that milestone is there to mark the end of each deliverable. Having a milestone for every deliverable in your project is going to do a couple of things for you. Probably the most important thing that it's going to do is it's going to make it easier for you to set dependencies between deliverables. Because when we talk about dependencies in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you that you should never ever, ever, under any circumstance, there's no exception to this rule, put a dependency on a summary task. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. 
So you want to have those dependencies on the milestones if you need to connect that whole deliverable has to finish before something else can start um, in other tasks or deliverables in the schedule. It also makes your reporting easier. You can quickly generate, you know, depending on how long your schedule is and how many deliverables you have, it's possible you could create a very quick, high-level one-page report that shows you your milestones um, and when they're going to finish. You can even track, you know, capture variances and, and track that in a report as well. The last thing that it does is it will calculate the total work, the total duration, and the total cost for each deliverable. So you can see by deliverable, how much is it going to cost you? How much effort are you putting into it? This is important information if you get to a point where you need to reduce scope because you have a hard deadline and the deadline is the most important thing. The only way you're going to meet that deadline is if you start reducing scope. Having that information is beneficial, not necessarily saying you're going to reduce scope on that alone, but it is certainly helpful information. Now, before we go back to Microsoft Project, and I'll show you a little example of what I mean here by using this model to enter your work breakdown structure, let's talk for a minute about estimates. Estimates are usually made as either duration estimates, how many business days does it take, or work, effort, uh, work estimates, how much effort is required, how many person hours are required for this task. Now, I'll tell you right now that estimating in work is much more accurate. You're going to get better information. Um, however, it's also a lot more difficult, number one, to get the information from people. It's a lot more difficult to get people to update you with how many hours they've spent and how many hours they think are remaining on a task. Uh, it's definitely more challenging, but it's the better way to go if you have the option of doing that. Most organizations that I've worked with are estimating in duration. How many business days will it take to get this task completed? Because at the end of the day, the most important information that they need is when will the project finish? Is it going to finish on time? If it's not going to finish on time, what can I do to bring the date in so that it can finish on time? When you choose your, the way you're going to estimate, that's when you know what task type to set. When we looked at the options a few minutes ago, you can use either fixed units, fixed work, or fixed duration. There are a couple of other options around that. We're not going to go into those details right now. But basically, if you're going to make duration estimates, then you want to set the task type to fixed duration. You're going to make work estimates. You want to set the task type to fixed work. It's important to do this um, as a general rule because what that task type does is it tells Microsoft Project, you cannot recalculate this value. So if the task type is set to fixed duration, I can assign resources, the work will be calculated, and then later on I need to change my resources. Maybe one of them quit, so now it's just going to be one instead of two. When I remove that resource, it will not change my duration, it would change the work. That's not to say that you necessarily always want it to work that way, but that's what the task type does for you. So the general idea is if you are making the estimate in duration, you don't want the tool to recalculate that duration. Now, the good news is maybe there are some tasks that you're estimating in duration and some that you're estimating in work, and that's okay too because you can set this on a task-by-task -task basis. And the last thing I'll tell you about this is don't get too attached to your task types because although you may set them up as fixed duration in the beginning of the schedule, I can almost guarantee you that at one point or another when you are making revisions to your schedule, you will likely need to change that task type based on how you want project to recalculate the values for that task. So you're going to be playing with these on a regular basis. You know, one of the biggest complaints that I hear from people about Microsoft Project, um, they'll say something to the effect of, you know, I go in and, and I take a resource off a task and all of a sudden my duration is 1,000 days. Or I change a duration and all of a sudden my resource is assigned at, you know, 500% uh, instead of, you know, 100%. And that, that is the biggest complaint that I hear from people. And the entire reason that they are seeing those kinds of changes is because of the task types. You master the task types, you are going to get rid of a lot of headaches of working with Microsoft Project. So let's go back into project. Let's take a look at that model I talked about for the work breakdown structure. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the duration and work estimates and how you can add those on a task-by-task -task basis. 
So I'll give this just a, a minute or two to load for you. And you should see Microsoft Project pop up onto your screen here in just a few minutes. And in the interest of time, I'm going to use a schedule that I already put together, and we're just going to kind of build on it. So first, let's talk about that work breakdown structure. You've got scope, analysis, software requirements, design, et cetera. These are my deliverables within this project. And then below those deliverables, I have detailed tasks showing me what needs to happen in order for this deliverable to be completed. Notice at the very end, uh, for example, um, on the deliverable analysis software requirements, the very end it says analysis complete, and you can see that's a milestone. At the end of every deliverable, you want to have a milestone. So here where it says scope complete, I need to make that a milestone. And when we talk about dependencies, you'll understand that a little bit more, why I want to do that. And so I've got my, uh, my work breakdown structure captured in here along with the detailed tasks. Now I need to enter either duration or work estimates. The first thing I'm going to do is insert the work column so that I can have a choice between work and duration. The other thing I need to do is I haven't changed the task type for this project. So if I double click on any random task and go to the advanced tab, you can see that this one is still fixed units, which is the default out of the box task type. And that's the one that you're almost never going to use. So I need to do two things. I need to change my options so that all new tasks are, not, you know, are fixed, we'll go with fixed duration. And then I also need to change my existing tasks. So let's change the option for all new tasks first. You're going to go to file and then options and over to that schedule tab, scroll down, default task type, I'm going to change that to fixed duration and click OK. That will apply for new tasks. It's not going to change existing tasks. In order to change the existing tasks, I'm going to click on any column header so that every row is selected. And then again on the task ribbon, I'm going to move over to the right and select information. Go to the advanced tab and I'm going to change the task type to fixed duration for all of those tasks. Now as I begin to assign resources and then make any additional changes, the tool will not recalculate the values for duration. So I'm going to enter some durations here. There we go. We've got our durations entered. We've got our milestones set up. We have our estimates. If you are estimating in work, you could enter that in the work column. And be aware that you can actually estimate both the duration and the work. Very common scenario, I've got a task that I'm estimating, it's going to take me 10 hours to finish. But it's going to take me five days to complete that 10 hours of work because I've got so much other stuff going on. Very common scenario. So I could enter in here, and let me change this to five days and I'll change this to 10 hours. Now what's going to happen is when I assign a resource to that task, it's going to automatically calculate what percentage of that resource's time is being applied to that task based on the fact that it's going to take me five days to do 10 hours of work. So it's very easy to get the tool to calculate that percentage for you rather than you having to try and figure that out and get back to it um, you know, by just playing with those numbers until it gets to exactly where you want it to be. So we talked about the options in step one. We talked about entering the estimates. And we talked about the task types, what task types you're going to use. We talked about the model. That's what I was forgetting. I was forgetting step two, entering the work breakdown structure, and then the estimates. Let's go back into the presentation, and we're going to look at a couple of more slides. And then we'll come back over here and talk about dependencies. Give me just a second. See, I can't do something and talk at the same time all the time. All right, so the presentation should be loading for you. We already talked about the estimates. The next thing for us to take a look at is dependencies. These are hard and fast rules about dependencies. I know that every rule, almost every rule, has an exception, right? You always hear that. There's an exception to every rule. There is not an exception to this rule. There are no exceptions to this rule. I have never, ever seen a situation where this rule would not apply. Never put a dependency on a summary task. If you need to show that this entire deliverable has to finish before something else can start, 
Use that milestone at the end of the deliverable. Never put it on the summary task. Putting the dependencies on the summary tasks, number one, can make your critical path inaccurate. It can also make it very difficult to tell if you have all of the necessary dependencies within your schedule. You want to make sure that every finish date has a dependency on it. The only exception to that rule is obviously your summary tasks. And then the very last task in the schedule, which is typically a milestone that says project complete. But all finish dates of tasks and all finish dates of milestones must have a dependency on it. That's the only way that you're going to get a dynamic model of your project. So if you want to see, okay, if the duration of task two changes, how does that impact task 30? If you want to be able to see those changes and see it, you know, be a live model of your project, you have to have a dependency on all of the finish dates because your network has to be complete in order for that schedule to be dynamic. Every milestone, every task, never on summary tasks. Now, in addition to working with your typical finish to finish tasks, uh, sorry, finish to start tasks, you also have start to start or finish to finish. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to point it out to you because nine times out of ten, if I ask someone to tell me what is a start to start relationship between two tasks in Microsoft Project, they will tell me it means two tasks must start at the same time. That is not correct. It does not mean they must start at the same time. And it will not always schedule them to start at the same time. Now, by default, are they going to be set up to start at the same time? As long as they don't have different predecessors, sure, that's how it's going to be set up. But look at the example here, and you can't really read that. That's task E at the bottom. Task E is a predecessor for task D. It finishes later than the start of task C. So although there is a start-to-start -start relationship from C to B, B is starting after the start of C. It is not going to make sure that they always start at the same time. All it's saying is that before B can start, or I'm sorry, D, see I can't even read it. Before task D can start, task C must start. So D can start when C starts or any time after C starts. It just can't start before C starts. So make sure you understand that um, difference in the start-to-start -start dependency and what exactly that's really doing to your schedule. So that's dependencies. We're going to go look at several different ways you can capture dependencies in your schedule. And while we're there, we're also going to talk about deadlines and constraints. Now, if you see a lot of error messages or warning, I don't know, what does it call it, warnings or tips, you know, from the wizard, and uh, they say, this may, or, you know, this may cause a scheduling conflict or, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm talking about. We've all seen them. And the reason we've seen them is because at one point or another, we have all put a hard constraint on a task in our schedule. A hard constraint is a finish no later than constraint, a start no later than constraint, must start on or must finish on. Don't use those, ever. Avoid them at all costs. There is a better way to show that a task or a project has to finish by a particular date, and it's called using a deadline. A lot of people who've been using project for years are not aware of the deadline feature, so I want to make sure we look at that today because it is a much better way to manage deadlines within your schedule than to put those hard finish dates um, that's going to generate all kinds of errors and give you all kinds of headaches. So let's go back into Microsoft Project. Let's talk about dependencies, and let's talk about the deadlines and constraints as well. So you will see Microsoft Project come up here again in just a minute. All right. That should be loading for you, should come up very shortly. Let's talk about dependencies first. Now, if you've been using Project for any length of time at all, you know how to set dependencies. I'm willing to bet, however, that you don't know all of the many ways you can set dependencies, and I don't know that we're going to go through every single one of them right now. But I do want to show you a variety of ways that you can set dependencies on your tasks in your project schedule because one way might be a little bit easier than another way for you. I think the most common method that I see being used is the predecessors column. So I'm just going to drag this over here next to my task name. I see people using the predecessors column. So let's say task three. We want task three to start when task two finishes. 
So you'll come over here to the predecessor column and you'll type a 2 and hit enter and it sets that finish to start dependency. Now, I don't use this method to set dependencies on between tasks unless I have multiple tasks that need to finish before one task can start. For example, let's say that task 4 cannot start until both tasks 2 and 3 finish. The quickest way to set up that relationship is to type in 2, comma 3, hit enter, and you're done. Finish to start relationships. Both of those tasks have to finish before the third one can start. I'm going to remove those dependencies once again. The easiest, quickest way to set dependencies between tasks, you highlight the tasks that are in that waterfall. You know, the ones that are all finished to start, highlight them. And then on your task ribbon, there's a little link icon. Click on it, and it automatically drops the finish to start relationship between all of those activities. Now, even if all of these are not exactly start, uh, finish to start, maybe you've got a finish to finish relationship, for example, between, let's say, these two tasks here. Go ahead and set them all as finish to start if they're in a path like that. And then you can come back and edit this relationship very easily. All you have to do is double click on the line between them and you get the task dependency dialog box. Right here, I can change this to be finish to finish. I could even add a lag or lead if I wanted to. Click OK. Now it's a finish to finish relationship, which by the way means that the second task can't finish before the first. It doesn't mean they have to finish at the same time, just can't finish before the first one finishes. So you've changed that. Um, the last thing we need to do in this particular grouping of tasks, we've got to make sure that milestone is tied into the schedule, right? Everything has to finish before we can say this deliverable is finished. Right now, we've got all of these tasks linked together. So we don't have to do anything other than link the task five to the milestone. Another way that you can do that is to simply click on the taskbar and drag it over until you have the next item highlighted, and it'll set a finish to start dependency for you as well. So you can see that information there. Now there's one more thing I want to show you with regard to dependencies. I use a split screen probably nine times out of ten. If I have Microsoft Project open, I'm going to have a split screen up because I get lots of helpful information from a split screen. To get a split screen in 2010 or 2013, all you have to do is on the task ribbon, go over to the right, and there's an icon called Details. If I click on that Details icon, by default, it's going to give me resource information on the left and predecessor information on the right. Now, what I like about this is I'm going to click on task 13. Keep in mind that when you click on a task, you are seeing information for only one task at a time, so only that task that you have selected. I can change this to a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to right click and I'm going to change it to predecessors and successors. So I can see everything that is driving that task and I can see everything that is being driven by that task as well. This is helpful when I'm trying to figure out why tasks are scheduled to start and finish when they are and how changing this task might impact something else in the schedule. Another view that I like to use, and we haven't talked about resources yet, but another view I like to use, you right click, you can select work. And in work, I would see all of the resources assigned to that task, their units, how much work they've been assigned, actual work, remaining work, even baseline work. This is very helpful for me because a lot of times, you know, I might have three people working on the same task, and in the beginning, you know, it's a nine-hour task. They each have three hours, but things change, and now Sally's going to do four hours, and, you know, Sam is only going to do two hours or what have you, and I can come in and adjust it here very easily. So I really enjoy using that split screen view. I'll go ahead and close that just by double-clicking on it or clicking on the details icon at the top. Last thing I want to do here is talk with you about those constraints and deadlines. Now, first of all, I can't tell you how often I see people say, well, let's see, task 27, if I can click on the right one here, task 27, it's, you know, we're going to go in and, and put a start date on it. So I'm going to change the start date to, let's say, 417. And it gives me this wonderful, helpful dialog box. And what do we do when we see this? We say move the task and keep the link. And we might even say don't tell me about this again. 
we click OK, it pushes the tasks out. What is happening when we do this? We enter that date, and it is applying a start no earlier than constraint for 417. The same thing is true if you entered a finish date. So let me undo that. If I were to come in here, and what I want to tell the tool is this task has to finish by 417. That's what I'm trying to tell it. But when I add that 417 date, it automatically pushes it to finish on 417 because what I'm actually telling the tool is it can't finish before 417. All right, it has a finish no earlier than. So entering a date here in the finish column is not going to be helpful for you um, unless you just want it to not finish any earlier than that specific date. But that's another scenario. If you wanted to show that a task or the entire project has to finish by a specific date, what is the project deadline? The best way to do that is to go into the project complete task at the very end of that milestone. See right now we're finishing on 424. I'm going to double click on the milestone, go to the advanced tab. Very first drop down under a constrained task is called deadline. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, all right, we're finishing on 424. I'm going to say my deadline is 428. Click OK. You get this, I don't know if you can tell that it's a green outline of an arrow pointing down. That indicates my deadline. <clears throat> now, if something happens in my schedule that's going to cause me to move beyond that deadline, watch what happens. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to change the duration of task 30. Instead of being five days, I'm going to make it 10 days. Notice it pushes the finish date out beyond the deadline. So anytime you see a milestone to the right of a deadline, it's always bad. That's bad news. If it's to the left of the deadline, you're in good shape. But the other thing it does, if you've got your indicator column um, visible here, it gives you the little red triangle with an ex exclamation point in the middle of it, and it's telling you the task is going past its deadline, which is Tuesday, 428.15. This is the best way to capture deadlines or hard finish dates within your schedule. Let's compare this to what happens when you put that finish no later than constraint on your task. So I just clicked undo twice. I no longer have a deadline here. I'm going to use the same date, though. I'm going to double click on the task. And this time on the advanced tab, I'm going to go to constraint type and say, Finish no later than, because that's the most popular one. And I'm going to say finish no later than oh, it's on, the, on Tuesday the 28th. That's the date that we used earlier. And I'm going to click OK. Now, typically, you would get another warning message here, though at some point I checked that little box, don't tell me about this again. And I have tried every option I can find to get it to come back again. And it's gone forever for me. I don't know if that happens for everybody, but it's gone forever for me. So what we have said here is that this task cannot finish later than 428. And you can see the little icon over here with the red dot on it. That lets you know it's a finish no later than, or it could be a start no later than. It's just one of your no later than constraints if it's got a red dot. Let's make the same change here that we made earlier. We said, I believe it was five days, and we said we were going to make it 10 days. So when I change this to 10 and hit Enter, Here's that planning wizard message that I mentioned earlier. Um, I am willing to bet that you guys have probably all seen this at one time or another because we probably have all used that finish no later than constraint, which is a bad idea, just as a reminder. But what we do when we see this, it says task 32 has a task constraint or is linked to a task that can't move. Well, task 32 is not the constraint, not the task that has a constraint on it, number one. That kind of irritates me, but whatever. It says cancel and avoid the conflict. Well, that's nice. I'd love to avoid the conflict, but that task is truly going to take 10 days now, and I need to capture that. So I'm going to say continue, allow the scheduling conflict. And although it's very tempting to say don't tell me about this again because ignorance is bliss, we want to avoid doing that. I'm going to click OK. Look what happens. Whoops, let me scroll back a little bit. It will not allow that milestone to move beyond 428. However, it will move everything else around it. It will push all other tasks you know, that are being pushed out because of dependencies out beyond that milestone date. Now, right here, when you're looking at it, it's pretty obvious that this is happening. 
But if you have a, you know, let's say task four that has gone beyond that deadline date, and your deadline, your constraint is on task 325, you're not necessarily going to see the difference right here. And you may think, oh, fantastic, we're finishing on 428, which is our deadline date. It can get very clunky. I would suggest strongly that you avoid those finish no later than constraints as much as possible. Now, I'll also tell you this. Um, chances are you have inherited a schedule at one point or another. So project manager A puts the schedule together, starts managing the project. Project manager A goes away. Project manager B steps in, takes over the project, and is stuck with that schedule because actuals have already been recorded to it. So project manager B can't really start over and create his own schedule, although probably that's typically what he would want to do, or at least that's what I always want to do. The first thing I do when I inherit a schedule, I make sure I'm looking at this indicator column, and I scroll down and I look for red dots on calendars. The more red dots I see, the more trouble I know I'm in, and the more work and effort and time it's going to take me to get the schedule to a workable point. Uh, so that's the very first thing that I do when I'm trying to figure out how to go forward with a schedule that someone else built. To remove that constraint because we don't want to keep it there, I'm going to double click on the task. I'm going to change that back to as soon as possible and click OK. Now it goes out to where it's supposed to be. I can change my duration back to five days and all is well and good. All right, we have about 15 minutes left. I'm talking too much, so I'm not going to even jump back over to the presentation. We want to go straight into defining your resources and assigning them to tasks within your project schedule. The first thing you're going to do is build your project team. So you have to let project know who's going to be doing the work on your schedule. Now, I'm going to scroll up to the top where I don't have resources assigned here. The most common way that I see people assigning resources to tasks is they come over here to this resource names column and they just type in people's names. This is not the best way to do it. There is a much better way to do it, a much more efficient way to do it. And the other method will decrease the risk of you using the same resource twice, just a slightly different name, like Sal, uh, Joe versus Joseph or something like that. So you never want to start here. You want to start on the resource sheet view. So I'm going to right click on this view bar to my left. I'm going to scroll down and select resource sheet. Now you can see some resources that are already here in the schedule. I'm going to add new resources. Disregard the icons that you see here. These are loaded from project server and they're generic. So that's why you see the little two-headed icons there. I'm going to add Sally as a resource, Sally Jones and Joe Smith. Oops, I spelled his name wrong. Joe Smith and Bob Jones. Sally and Bob are brothers and uh, brother and sister. <laughs> anyway, so we have these three local resources. Again, disregard the icons here. That has something to do with Project Server. So I've entered my resource information. These are all work resources. If you wanted to capture travel expenses for a task, you could create a cost resource and then use that to assign to tasks and capture those expense um, amounts as well. We're not going to go through that right now. If it's a material resource, you could set that up as well um, and then track how you're referring to those material resources. You can adjust the max units of your resource. So let's say that Bob is splitting his time half and half between this project and another one. I want to change this to 50%, which is fine. I can do that. Keep in mind that the tool will allow me to schedule Bob at 100%. I could schedule him at 1,000% if I wanted to. The only thing this field does for me is it lets me know when Bob is over allocated. So if I assign Bob at 100% to a task, and his max units is set to 50 right here, as soon as I assign Bob to that task, project is going to tell me Bob's over allocated. As long as he's not assigned at any one given point in time more than 50%, everything's fine. But if he is more than 50%, it's going to show me that he's over allocated. I'm going to leave him at 100 for this demonstration. Now, one of the benefits of using Project Server or Project Online is Bob Sally and Joe would be part of an enterprise resource pool. So I'd actually go out to Project Server through Microsoft Project, 
pull those resources down. And what that's going to do for me is it will let me know when Bob is available, not just based on this one project, but based on every project across the organization that Bob is working on and that is kept in Project Server or Project Online. It's going to show me if I you know, assign Bob to a task and create an over allocation for Bob. So it's a great way to manage your resource allocations and avoid over allocating your resources. You can track cost rates and even different calendars for your resources if you need to. Once you have them entered in the resource sheet, you're going to go back over to your Gantt chart view. Now, again, you've got this resource names column. You could come in here and check off the resources. I don't like doing it that way. Um, it, it's not necessarily a bad way to do it, but I think there's a much more efficient way to do it. If you go over to the resource ribbon, all the way towards the left, you have an icon called Assign Resources. Now this Assign Resources dialog box will allow you to assign one or more resources to one or more tasks at the same time. So let's first look at Determine Project Scope. Because remember, we said the duration was five days, but it was going to take us 10 hours uh, to finish the task, but spread over a five-day period. I'm going to select Bob and assign Bob to that task. And notice it's showing me that Bob is assigned at 25% of his time or his calendar because it's going to take five days to do 10 hours of work. Now, let's say that hmm, the same resources are going to work on tasks three, four, and five equally. If I'm using the resource names column, I'm clicking in each field or I'm copying down. But here I can highlight the tasks. I can select Joe, I can hold my control key down and select Sally, click assign, and boom, it's done. Sally and Joe are both assigned to all three of those tasks. And I could select and highlight those tasks throughout the project as needed to assign different teams of people. Now, there's one more thing that I want to tell you about working with Microsoft Project and Resources because this is confusing in my opinion and even annoying in my opinion. All right, so you can see up here, you've got Bob Jones and you've got 25% out there. This is showing you how Bob was originally assigned to this task. Now this is a fixed duration task, so if I change the work, it should change the units. So I'm gonna come in here and change the work to 20 hours. Notice the units did not change for Bob. Actually, they did change. They changed behind the scenes. You just can't see it here because what is going to be reflected here is what you initially assigned Bob to that task at. Very frustrating to me. This started in 2010. Prior to 2010, if I made that exact same change, it would show me a different percentage, which was realistic for Bob on that task. But people complained about that. They didn't like to see those percentages changing. It got confusing. So Microsoft decided, that, well, okay, great. We're not going to show you that it's changing. We're still going to change it, but we're not going to tell you about it. So in order to see the correct percentage that Bob has been assigned to this task, you have to go to either a task usage view or a resource usage view, um, any assignment view, basically. I'm going to go to the task usage view. And so we're going to look at that task. It was the very first one. And you're going to insert a column called peak. Very few people even know that this column exists. I'm going to enter the peak column, and it shows me here the reality of how Bob is assigned to that task. 50% of his time is now assigned to that task, not 25, which is what you see in the Gantt chart. Again, the Gantt chart is reflecting how Bob was originally assigned to that task. You've got to go to an assignment view, insert that peak column if you want to see um, the, the truth, the reality of how Bob has been assigned to that task. Last thing I'm going to show you, and then we've got to wrap up. Once you have your dependencies, your resources, everything is set up, you're comfortable with the schedule, it's time to save your baseline. Now I'm going to go over the tracking Gantt view. You don't have to be on the tracking Gantt view. I just I like to see the bars pop up. So I always go to the tracking Gantt view. And I'm missing a dependency here. Let me just drag that somewhere. All right. When you save your baseline, you want to keep two things in mind. The first thing is you may want to save another baseline 
down the road in this project. Maybe you've got new information. Maybe scope has been added. You're a third of the way through the project. You have a much better idea of how long things are going to take. And you want to start tracking variants based on that new baseline. So the first assumption is that you going to, at some point, may want to change your, uh, your baseline, baseline it at a new point in time. And the second assumption is that when you change your baseline, you want project to calculate all the variances based on the new baseline, not the old baseline. So what you're going to do to accomplish that, you're going to go to the project ribbon, and then you're going to select set baseline, set baseline. We're going to set the baseline. This is what I'm referring to as baseline zero. I wish they would actually put a zero behind it. Because when you click on it, you can see you also have baselines one through 10. We're going to call this one baseline zero. This is what project makes its calculations on. So it's going to, in order to calculate finish variance, it's going to look at your baseline zero finish, compare it to your current finish date, and that's how it's going to determine what the variance is. We're going to set the project's baseline for the entire project. I'm going to click OK. Baseline has been set. You can see that. Before I do anything else in this project, I am not going to change a thing. I'm immediately going to go back to set baseline. I'm going to set baseline. And this time I'm going to set this as baseline 1. Setting it as baseline 1 means that forever and always, I will know that baseline 1 was my original baseline for the schedule. So I can always go back to it if I want to. I can always create uh, fields and track formulas so that I can track variants based on that original baseline at some point if I need to. But I never want to lose the information of what my baseline originally looked like. So I'm going to save it to baseline 1. All right, now we have this baseline saved twice. Fast forward with me. We're going to make some changes to some tasks here. Say that one was one day. So things are moving. Things are slipping away from their uh, baselines. We now are in a better situation. We've got more information. We feel much better about when, when things can happen realistically. So what we're going to do is we want to save another baseline. I want to track variants from this point in time forward. All right? Maybe I've added scope even, or maybe I've reduced scope. I'm going to go back to the project ribbon, select set baseline, set baseline. And I am going to save over baseline zero, which a lot of people will tell you is a big no-no. You never want to do that. But I'm going to say, yes, you do. Save over baseline zero because you have that baseline preserved in baseline one. Now, remember, you're only going to do this if you want to track variants from the new baseline. So I'm going to save over baseline zero. Yes, I'm sure. And then I'm immediately going to come back. And this time, I'm going to save this as baseline two. So I will always and forever know baseline two is the second time I baseline my schedule. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not encouraging you to save lots of baselines in your schedule. You should only save a new baseline when something major happens. Um, or if in the beginning it's kind of a tentative thing, you know, and you're get, still gathering information. Um, this is for adding scope, major changes in scope, adding, reducing scope, major changes in budget, major changes in resource availability, things of that nature are reasons why you might re-baseline your schedule. If you're using all 10 of those baselines, uh, we probably ought, ought to have a little chat offline, figure out why you're doing that and whether or not that's the best approach for you. All right, so let's go back into the presentation. Give me just a second here. And we are going to wrap up. So we'll let that load. We talked about step one, which was defining your project. We talked about step two, which was entering your tasks. And then we looked at entering those estimates. Remember, use fixed duration for duration estimates and fixed work for work estimates. We talked about entering dependencies, entering constraints, defining and assigning resources. And as I suspected, we did not get to analyzing the critical path or any entering progress information because I have a tendency to talk too much. So we'll have to put that in another webinar, and hopefully you guys will all come back and join us for that. Last thing I'm going to pull up for you is information on how you can contact us. Please feel free to contact me with any questions, any feedback, any concerns, cindy.more at ilmsprojectnow.com. 
or you can email info at msprojectnow.com. Obviously, if you send it to cindy.more, it's going to come directly to me. I would be happy to help point you in the right direction. If you've got a question about how to do something in project or if something can be done in project, I am more than happy to help you out with that. Um, it kind of keeps me on my toes because every now and again somebody will send something to me and I have absolutely no idea. And I'm, you know, geeky enough that I'm going to sit down and play with it until I figure it out because that's just what I do. Also, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me by searching for Cindy Moore and looking for the company MS Project Now. I would love to connect with you there and keep you informed of different things that we have going on here. We've got a blog. We update on a regular basis with helpful tips and tricks, some troubleshooting information, um, and then other webinars that may be coming up in the future. So once again, I appreciate you guys uh, sticking with me today. Hopefully you've learned some very helpful tips and tricks that you can apply in your use of Microsoft Project. If you've got an interest in learning more about Project Online or Project Server, reach out to me. I'd be happy to do a demonstration of that for you and uh, others in your organization. And again, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or comments. I appreciate your particip participation today, and I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon.